So pre-pandemic, uh, I thought that our mission statement actually was we wanted to empower the world's transition towards remote work. About six months into the pandemic, we actually said, man, maybe we should actually change our mission statement because I think we're done. <laughs> I think, it, you know, when you choose a mission statement, you think to yourself, well, this is something that you should never achieve. Right. If you actually achieve it, then uh, where the heck do you go next? Yeah. Yeah. But the difference that I'm really making, at least for me, is again, communicating that not all work has to be a place and that the freedom that you can gain from disconnecting work from time and space is incredibly powerful. And I think it's the single thing that I could do to be able to make the world a better place. Welcome everyone to another episode of As Told by Nomads. And today I have with me an amazing guest. His name is Liam Martin. Now Liam is a multi-hyphenate. He's the CEO of, uh, I'll say that again. That's <laughs> the CEO, your CMO. Um, let's do this. Either way. Yeah. Welcome everyone to another episode of As Told by Nomads. And today's guest is Liam Martin. Now, Liam has been working on this secret project. It's a book. It's called Running Remote, Master the Lessons from the World's Most Successful Remote Work Pioneers. And he also runs a conference on remote work. And so he does many things around the idea of remote work, asynchronous work, you know, even fighting against biases that exist on all levels. And today we're going to dissect, dive into the different ways we can discuss process design, hiring for inclusive, inclusivity, and making sure that we hire to get the best out of the, product, uh, the productive hours of our employees and our potential partners, as opposed to the conventional brick and mortar work that we see in today's world. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about to get, uh, to get into this because honestly, this has been a subject that uh, I've been waiting for a podcast to discuss this particular aspect of remote work, which I think is so interesting, which is basically remote work is an environment in which ideas are the most important. It's yeah. not what you look like. It's not, you know, what your sex is, what your gender is. It's ideas first. And a lot of people during the pandemic didn't actually recognize that. I call these guys lovingly pandemic panickers. You know, it was kind of <laughs> like remote at gunpoint uh, where it's like, everyone's gotta be remote in the next 24 hours and we gotta figure this thing out. But in that process, they actually forgot about what remote work really is, which is it's the ability to be able to build businesses with a degree of freedom and a degree of autonomy that very few other people in office environments can actually get access to. And I think that autonomy also extends to the, the big subject of equality that we've been talking about over the last couple of years. Well, I mean, to your point, if, you, if I look at your career, you know, you're the co-founder CMO of Time Doctor, and we can get, get into that later on. The staff.com, there's running remote. And then, you know, you, you've obviously run conferences on the concept of, of remote work as well. And, you know, an author, and by an author, I mean, you really did, you spent about a year and a half doing and studying research, you know, on every single aspect of this concept. And I want to start off this conversation with uh, delineating, I guess, the distinguishing rather between what remote work is and what forced remote work is. Because before COVID, there, was, there always was remote work. During COVID, a lot of companies were forced to have employees work remote. And I, I know that a lot of people have said this is a very different type of thing, uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know, when we're coming with definitions, because there are certain best practices that I felt like got thrown out the window once COVID hit. So could you distinguish between remote work before COVID and remote work during COVID? Let's take a one minute, very quick history lesson. Uh, I know that you're a professor, so I actually was. Uh, lecturer as well for about a year and a half and it was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> I ended up getting the worst academic reviews in the history of the department and the department that I was working for was 135 years old. So we can get into that probably in another podcast. One year history of remote work. January of 2020, 4.5% of the U.S. workforce was working remotely. March of 2020, 45% of the U.S. workforce was working remotely. We saw an exponential jump. Effectively half of the U.S. workforce was working remotely. And this is the biggest shift 
in work since the Industrial Revolution. But the Industrial Revolution took 80 years. We did the same thing in March. So we're, we're looking at this change to wait that work is done. And another aspect of this is long term, it looks like about 30% of the US workforce will be working remotely moving forward from now post pandemic, right? When quote unquote, we're, we're over, you know, the pandemic, which is never really, I mean, I don't know if we're going to have like pandemic day <laughs> where it's going to be like COVID's over, but I, hopefully we have one of those days. That'd be great. Uh, so when you see where we're kind of moving as, uh, as a civilization, fundamentally, we are disconnecting work from time and space. And the implications for that are massive. I mean, we could talk about it for four or five hours, honestly, all of the implications that we're dealing with. But the biggest one that I want to touch on, which you had touched on before, is the difference between what I am calling work from home and remote work. So if you're listening to this right now and you have been working from home for the past two and a half years, you really haven't been working remotely yet. Uh, working from home is there's a scary virus outside of your door that you may or may not kill you. So you can't go outside. You can't go to a co-working space. You can't hang out with friends or family. You can't travel and work remotely. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions placed upon you because remote work is actually the ability to take your work with you. Work is no longer a place when you think about remote work. Working from home is actually a place. It's just your home. You switch the office for your house. And honestly, the house is probably a little bit better <laughs> than the office, um, grand scheme of things. But real remote work, the future of what I see as work is going to be returning to the remote work that I've enjoyed for almost 20 years and dozens and dozens of other companies that are incredibly successful have enjoyed as well. Wow. And I think that's so well put. Yeah, I like that you described this work from home because now we see the acronyms like hashtag WFH, you know, work from home, work from home tips. I remember the rise. It was, uh, you know, if you talk about Google searches, Google searches became this thing where where you type work and then the, the suggestion will be from home. <laughs> and I, I remember doing that all the time. And I, I used to get a lot of requests about that. Before we, I want before I go down this rabbit hole of what's going to happen with the hybrid systems as we navigate outside of this pandemic, I, I want to continue down that idea of location independence and work from home, right? So, mm -hmm. with work from home, it sounds like there's this idea of you you have no choice. You know, it's, mm. This is what's happened. <laughs> yeah, you know we have to do it. And then with remote work, it, it's a choice. You opt into that. This is that is that fair? Yeah, and I would also say work from home is fundamentally from your home. It's this pandemic panicker kind of remote at gunpoint philosophy, which is there's no other choice. We have to work at home. This is an emergency work from home type of situation. And mm. then when I agree, when you're at a point in which we can choose this, things are going to change in a big way. Um, yeah. I don't know about you, but Two and a half years ago, I had a co-working space that I could go to whenever I wanted. I could go to a coffee shop whenever I wanted. You know, these things are coming back, but they're really going to ratchet up once, and again, knock on wood, once COVID's over, um, we're going to move in at a t into a type of work that is going to completely transform the way that you perceive work. And one of the biggest aspects uh, connected in some part connected to your podcast is digital nomadism is the ability to be able to actually take your work with you, right? Yeah. There were 5 million digital nomads pre-COVID. There are estimates that there are about 50 million now. Uh, so that's an exponential jump. Sheesh. And I actually am projecting that there's probably over the next 10 years, we're probably going to see about half a billion digital nomads all over the world. Wow. Uh, and that's going to be an incredibly powerful concept to come across because when you're like, uh, and we're seeing really interesting stuff happen in the nomad space, like 55 year old professionals that are just saying to themselves, you know what? I don't really want to work for the next five years to get my pension. I'd rather quit right now and do some consulting on the side and make five grand a month and go to Costa Rica. I actually just spoke to someone yesterday that was specifically doing that. And then on the other side of the spectrum, <clears throat> you're seeing 22 year olds that are saying to themselves, why would I want to sit in corporate America for the next five to 10 years when I could actually just start doing freelance work or even just long-term positions 
but I'm going to be doing it from a laptop. And I might be in Lisbon, you know, for three months, and I might be in Barcelona for the next three months, or, um, you know, uh, any other place that you could possibly think of. No, I, I think what you're reflecting on there is the, the fact that we're in a time where systems are being challenged. And this is the intersection of your work and my work, because I, I, you know, I launched my company in, in 2014, and I've been you know, working you know, at several places before uh, prior to that. But when I started w- working on, with my, you know, my colleagues who worked anywhere, you know, they could be you know, in another state, in another country, as long as the work was met at a certain deadline that we mutually agreed, that was what it was. And then when COVID happened, I had this interesting request, uh, you know, backlog where I actually could work more places than I, I used to before, because normally I'll be traveling to Brazil or I'll be traveling to Barcelona to go to the company and dissect that. But the only thing that happened now was I could do Netherlands and Brazil and, and you know, Nigeria in one day. It just depends on how I scheduled my time. And, and, and I'm noticing that as we move out of COVID knock and wood, there's this idea of doing that as well. And I, I know it's not quite a synchronous work, which you're going to dive into next, but a synchronous work is essentially the practice of working on a team that does not require all members to be online simultaneously. And I've, I, I've noticed that with my businesses, if I'm doing a podcast one day versus writing a book versus being a professor versus being a consultant, my overall business can operate that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just, I don't have to be online at the same time, but you know, we have this mutual agreement of a deadline at a certain thing. And then we check in when we check in. So, yeah, yeah. that was the core thing that I really was surprising to me um, when I started researching the book. So when I started researching running remote and I had done the running remote conference, the book and the conference have the same name. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, You can talk to my publisher about that, but the, uh, (laughs) the, the book itself, I was studying and trying to figure out what makes all of these remote pioneers tick? So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I ended up, very first company that I talk about in the book is a company called Coinbase. And it is a, a cryptocurrency wallet. So basically open it up, it's on your phone and you can put your Bitcoins or your Ethereum in it. And they debuted on the S&P 500 at number 89, a $141 billion IPO. Um, massive, massive company, right? Like very few companies go public and get onto the S&P 500 (laughs) when they go public. So we're talking about a very, very big company. And for the first time in the history of the SEC, they have been able to state that their headquarters are nowhere. And the reason why was because they said anything else would be a lie. They don't actually have a headquarters. They don't have a location. They've built this company completely remotely. And for any of you guys that know about the history of remote work and remote first companies, um, we had a big chip on our shoulder, literally until COVID, because venture capitalists wouldn't necessarily pay attention to us. We were called kind of like lifestyle businesses. We were called businesses that weren't really serious. You've got a cute little half million dollar, million dollar business there. I hope it goes well, right? But it's not something that you actually build out. But the reality is, is that there's been a lot of companies that have been growing massive organizations remotely. And the one thing that they have in common is this concept that we break down in the book, which is called asynchronous management, which is the ability to, as you said, basically run a company without actually talking to anyone inside of that business. That's the core concept, which is, what if you could never talk to anyone inside of the company face-to-face? What if that was just impossible that had to be removed from the way that you built a company and these remote pioneers came up with this methodology in order to get over that problem but more importantly what this actually created was an environment where you could build and scale companies way faster than any on-premise in office model and that's the real exciting thing that i want to teach to as many people as possible and please i I want you to continue to teach that because in my study of asynchronous work, there's the idea of, you know, I actually think it boosts more documentation, transparency, right? It, does, it builds trust in, in their ability. Mm-hmm. You and I were talking about a topic that we, we're not, we're not going to bring on here, but the core element of the topic we were talking about before we, we hit record was this idea of trusting people, 
-hmm. right? And, and trusting and, and people to do what they've been trained to do all their lives. Right. And I believe that when you go towards a, a synchronous work, it you know removes away that micromanagement, but it also just builds that level of trust and, and, and transparency that can actually build a morale and take away all those elements that sometimes come into a work culture that can be toxic. Absolutely. So we have three core principles that I talk about in the book, which is deliberate communication, democratized processes, and detailed metrics. Yeah. So those are the three big parts of remote work. And if when you think about asynchronous work specifically, when we've studied these companies, one of the other things that we found, which is really counterintuitive, is their managerial layer is about 50% of what an on-premise, in-office, synchronous company is. And so when I actually started to figure this out, I was like, wow, okay, so there's way less managers in asynchronous companies than there are in synchronous companies. Well, number one, that makes those companies way more efficient, right? You, you need, because like when you think about management, management's a critical part of running a business, but fundamentally, mm -hmm. what is a manager? A manager's job is to manage other people who do the work, right? At the end of the day, fundamentally, it's like, they don't actually do the work in the business. They manage the people that do the work in the business. So if you can have less of that overhead and you can have, basically, I almost kind of think about it as the, a middleman issue, right? If you can remove the middleman as much as humanly possible, uh, we have a concept inside of asynchronous companies, which we call radical transparency. So when you join a company that's asynchronous, generally, you want every single person in that company to ideally have the same informational advantage as the CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. So how much money are we making? What's our P&L look like? Yep. Um, you know, what's our MPS? What's our EMPS? What customers are we losing? What customers are we gaining? And what this does is it creates number one, as you said, a massive environment of trust, right? It's like, well, actually we're not holding anything back from you. This is everything that we have. And you now have the responsibility as someone inside of the company to be able to add into that company and create value inside of that business. But more importantly, what it does is when you have to make a difficult decision, right? When you have to lay 10% of your workforce off inside of these asynchronous companies, people understand. Yeah. Because they actually have all the information in front of them. And if they don't understand and if they disagree on it, we can actually all have discussions about it very openly because there are no closed doors in asynchronous organizations because we don't have doors. <laughs> uh, we actually have an organization in which the platform yeah. is the manager, not necessarily these, uh, and you've probably been in them before, you know, these boardrooms where you drag eight six figure executives into a room and we have a debate as to whether or not we're going to get a blue paper clip or red paper clips um, for next quarter's order. I mean, this is, this is not the way to be able to run a business. And the thing is that if you go to any MBA class right now, you know, they're always focusing up talking about collaboration and synchronous communication being the absolute core tenant of the way to build a business. And the thing that I think might be true over the next 10 years is that that is a false assumption, um, that actually the reverse is true, that less collaboration or collaboration in a different way that is more cost efficient for everyone, an a la carte method as it applies to collaboration, what it might actually be a lot more effective. I've been in those rooms, to your point, uh, and you, yeah. you're right in your assumption. Uh, I also got my MBA and I, <laughs> I'm, I was the one of the most anti-MBA MBA students because <laughs> I went to an MBA with uh, everyone already on a track to write, you know, to go to a, a firm or, and everything. Yeah. And, and yeah. I knew the, my parents are Nigerian. So if you know about Nigerian, you, you, they like advancement in education. I just knew I wanted to use the two years to discover what I was doing. So I launched this podcast in, after my first year in the MBA and I decided I was going to be an entrepreneur there. But everything you said, was turned against me in school because everybody said I was wasting money and I was turning away a solid investment because I was trying to build a company that didn't require the communication the way it was taught in school. And I studied communication. This is why I was chuckling here. My, 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 my major, my MBA is communications and marketing. And so I saw that shift happening and it's continued to happen when ironically I now teach <laughs> or people will come to me to ask me to teach MBA students about different ways to communicate in mm -hmm. this in this lifestyle and that is because when when we look at what 
the history of the world has been and you think about the advancement of technology and the advancement of how we define certain social constructs, whether it's behavior or money, you know, or any of these things, if we don't find a way to make our offices and the systems and offices shift to the value systems of the next generation, there's going to be such a huge disconnect. We started to see it with the great resignation, but that gasp, that, that gap rather, and that chasm is going to continue to widen if people aren't willing to unlearn their rigid ways of communicating, of leading, of managing, mm. or investing. Yep. No, I'll give you one other story, which I think is blows a lot of people's minds. And I have this in the book. Uh, Amir, who is the founder of a company called Todoist, which is- a Oh, I know Amir. Internet. Yeah. He's been on the show. Yeah. Millions and millions of users, right? Yeah. Um, incredibly successful company has hundreds of employees. So Amir will tell you uh, that- uh, for about five years, there was an engineer in his company. He never met him in person. He never did a video call with him. He never did an audio call with him. Uh, the most that they did was a couple instant messages. And that was it. So they actually thought maybe this guy's a bot. And maybe he isn't a he. Maybe he's a she. Maybe he's a who knows what, right? But the reality was is that he was one of the best engineers in the company. And he was incredibly successful. Uh, in his job. Does it matter what that person looked like? Does it matter that you did those in-person calls with them? Does it matter, you know, whether or not that person's a bot or not? I mean, maybe it's an AI. If it is, great. Let's, let's hire some more, right? Because those right. are, those are people, those are, those are pieces of the machine that are building your organization. And I think we really have to get away with this concept of identifying people through their wrapper, and the beauty is that asynchronous work is actually the first form of management I'm really seeing where that could actually be true, uh, where you could hire people without necessarily having all of the other variables that connect to that and the best ideas can be presented. I, I talk a lot about how asynchronous management, I think, is going to see the rise of the introverted leader. Uh, you, you're oh. leading me to my next question. Oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. I love it. I love it. So, so for background, the reason why I got so excited about that is Liam studied sociology at uh, McGill University. I yes. study human behavior across cultures for a living. There's a, an intersection of that with sociology, human behavior. One of the, the most fascinating concepts that has, has, has come about during the pandemic is this idea of introversion versus extroversion. Some people who were previously extroverts have found that they became more introverted because of the fear. Some people who were introverted enjoyed what was happening. And then there was a mix in between where some people felt like they actually wanted more connection. All this to say, as we are shifting towards this, there are a lot of mental health implications on any side. And there are also a lot of benefits of the idea of an, an autonomy. I'm curious from your angle before we go into the rise of an introverted leader as to what you've observed, because I've seen it on all sides where people feel depressed more and people feel freedom more. So sure. what do you think that <laughs> pie is? I guess the pie chart is going to look like where people haven't connected so much that they crave for that and people have retreated and they like that privacy. So I think one of the core assumptions that you're making inside of that, and almost everyone else is making the same core assumption as well, is that <clears throat> unfortunately for adults, adults that are you know over the age of 25, what's their primary source of uh, socialization? It's their work. That's where their friends are, right? When you go to the office, you hang out with your uh, your work bestie, right? I can't remember what these, I see a bunch of TikToks. Can I yeah, work bestie, work husband, work, bestie, work wife. Work, that's yeah, it, yeah. <clears throat> right? Yeah. So then you have this concept, which is just like, I'm getting my socialization. I'm getting my disconnect from my family unit when I go to work. And when you work from home, obviously that same thing doesn't happen anywhere near to the same degree. And what I'm saying is we now have an opportunity to evolve past that because when you go to work, um, you know, your work bestie, your work husband, your work wife, that person wasn't chosen by you. You were put in that place and you had 20 people, let's say in the office and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go hang out with that person. The reality is, is that the world is a big open place and you can walk outside of your door and you can make friends with people, particularly post pandemic, 
when we couldn't do that, you know, pre-pandemic, I think a lot of this mental health issue is just actually connected to, I can't actually socialize with people. So therefore I can't see anybody, mm. but post-pandemic, we're really going to actually go into an environment where we're going to say, all right, you know what? Um, why don't I go do a, a, a workout program after work, 5 PM in the park every single day. And that's going to be a place where I can socialize. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult for adults to be able to make friends. Um, there was a quote, and I can't remember who said it, but said that uh, most men live lives of quiet desperation, and it's entirely connected to socialization. Uh, most men, after they actually end up getting into the work world, <clears throat> they have their kids, their wives are a lot more social, <clears throat> but men, they don't have that same type of form of socialization. It's a lot more difficult for them. And what I'm telling all of my male friends is try to get out there. You know, it's like, it's difficult to be able to do it, but if you do do it, you're actually going to be much happier because you're going to be able to be able to choose uh, who you want to socialize with as opposed to the work environment. Comes down to that, that word again, choice. And what you, if I'm getting what you're saying is yes, obviously we're going to move towards asynchronous work, but what, was the inherent flaw in my question was it was the assumption that work and friendship are inherently tied and you're like no work you, network is you, your social network yeah exactly Those, these things are disconnected yeah we put them together uh, throughout the entire history of the last you know basically post-world war ii that, you, uh, thank you for helping me out with that. I love when those when when and when I get challenged like that because we spend most of our time in some sort of education institution or work institution, and and it's important for me and anyone here listening to remember that you know some of these things, not some of these things, all of these things impact our programming and how we see the world. And what you're introducing into the consciousness now is this element of choice with work and also choice of friendships, but also an ability to choose this interest of our hobbies. A lot of us have been told what realistic versus not realistic is. And we had all these interests when we were kids. And now that we get to decide our environments, it's important for us to intentionally create those places that maximize the fullness of self. Oh, so. absolutely. I mean, you, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that the beauty of where we're at right now, and I think that COVID has taught us this lesson or retaught at least me this lesson, is you can craft your own future. Uh, your future is yours to build. And the reality is that and we've seen this with the great resignation. I actually think that the great resignation is going to turn into the great migration where people are really going to be able to say to themselves, you know what? I don't think I really want to work in New York anymore uh, because I can work in, you know, Iowa. I can work in Bali. I can work in Spain. I can work in Portugal. I can work in South Africa. It really doesn't matter. Uh, I can choose my own path and I can choose to do whatever the heck I want and I'll still be able to get paid. And this is a really exciting time, I think, for humanity where we've never had so much direction of freedom and autonomy than we currently have right now. And the reality is that the majority of the institutions around us, not to necessarily get too conspiratorial, but those institutions, it's within their interests to be able to make you believe that you don't have those options. Mm. In reality, you actually do have all of those options available to you. Um, the internet has empowered us to be able to do it. I have another quote in the book by Mark Andreessen from Andreessen and Horowitz. And he talks about how surprisingly, uh, this coming out of his mouth, he believes remote work is the biggest civilization shift, even more powerful than the internet itself because wow. it enables people to be able to move wherever they want and, and do work. We've currently, you know, uh, I know that this podcast is gonna be coming out in a couple months, but we're currently experiencing a lot of heartbreak uh, with some of our Ukrainian team members that are in yeah. Ukraine right now that refuse right. to leave. Uh, and I don't know where the conflict's gonna be in the next couple months, but it's one of those situations where we said, listen, you, can, you don't have to be in Ukraine. You can go somewhere else. We can fly you anywhere on planet Earth. And I think a lot of people are still locked into that mindset of, well, I have to stay in my city. I have to stay with these friends that I don't really like. Uh, I have to, you know, stay in this job that I don't really like. No, you can change all of those things. And remote workers are empowering you to be able to do it. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Now, I've stalled enough. You talking, you were trying, you were about to introduce us into the rise of the introverted leader, I think is what you said. Uh, sure. 
what's what's happening with that you know so i am relatively introverted in front of a large group of people i'm very it's very difficult for me to communicate i'm quite awkward in front of large groups of people uh and i know a lot of people that are not and you've probably been in these meetings you probably i mean you're an incredibly charismatic guy you probably are this person where 10 people go into a room and who ends up getting their ideas adopted the most? Generally, before even anyone opening up their mouths, you probably will know who it is. It's the six foot two, you know, all American guy, right? That's generally the person that's gonna have their ideas adopted. Now, does, do six foot two all American guys have the best ideas? No, no, they don't. Um, no. If anything, actually they might have the worst ideas in the room. But those are the ideas that end up getting adopted the vast majority of the time. Why? Because synchronous communication is has in itself a massive amount of bias, right? And it's just fundamental. Everyone has bias, right? Inside yeah. of, of what they're doing, their, their perception, right? It's like you're thinking about all of these different variables connected to a, a particular person. Asynchronous meetings and asynchronous individuals or asynchronous organizations have ideas as their most important asset. So the idea is what gets prominence. It's not necessarily the wrapper around that idea. So what we see, and there's a ton of research that's currently being done on this, um, a lot of it from Harvard Business Review, which has been really great at looking and understanding asynchronous organizations, is that when you remove all of these components of bias, you end up actually having people that would lead organizations that otherwise would not necessarily lead them. Um, you're seeing a lot more minorities, you're seeing a lot more uh, women lead organizations because they actually have the best ideas and not because, again, they're that six foot two all American star, right? That we've classically always followed because they're just fundamentally the most charismatic person. Now, there's another really interesting sociological aspect that connects to that. I don't know if you know this, but you can presume or you know whether or not someone is going to be successful based off of whether they are the tallest person in their class at the age of 12. Because that's when all of those, comp all of those kind of aspects of personality really crystallize is when you're 12 years old, if you're the tallest kid in the class, you're generally going to have a much more uh, charismatic poise towards you. You're going to make more money. You're going to be more successful because just everyone kind of looks up to you. Uh, it's kind of crazy how like height is one of these biggest factors that are outside of all these other variables that connect to it. But I find this really interesting and I find it incredibly stupid uh, because your height should <laughs> denote whether or not you have good ideas. No, it shouldn't. Uh, there are studies about CEOs and, and how you know, most of the CEOs are, you know, six foot and above, but that's, that's not yeah. majority of men and, and it happens all over the world. But I, I love that insight. People make that assumption. I, I'm an ambivert. So I, I definitely have a lot of extrovert energy, but if you, by myself, I'm, I'm, I, I recharge, you know, mm. when I'm researching or studying and when I go to conferences, I usually find a quiet room just to recharge. But when you see me, you would never guess because I love right. talking to people. So it's, I was so glad that there was a language for the ambivert aspect, but um, I, I, I certainly I've started to notice the reaction because I'm six one, and I, mm -hmm. I noticed as I grew taller, sometimes I'll say something, and then it then becomes imperative of me to make sure that I'm not the only voice saying something because I, I could obviously have the worst idea, as you pointed out, or I right. could just intimidate someone in a way that is uh, that it, you know is not inclusive. So. I, I love this episode because you're raising a, a bunch of things that people might take for granted, but do play a factor into the social condition of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a beautiful thing. Well, where can we find your book, sir? So you can find the book at uh, runningremote.com. And you can also check out our conference there. We do one, one to two times a year now that we're actually getting back to physical conferences, which is really exciting. And uh, there's a ton of extra bonuses there for anyone that's interested if you're literally in any way interested in looking at how you actually manage remote teams, not necessarily whether you should use Skype or Zoom or Google Meet, because that's actually the wrong question to ask. This is what this book specifically focuses on, which is the management philosophy behind very successful remote teams. 
the management philosophy of, of successful remote teams. And we'll make sure we we'll put the links in the show notes so you'll be able to get that. But before I let you go, Liam, my final question is this. It's my mission statement reframed as a question. So, Liam, how do you use your difference to make a difference? Didn't put me on the spot for this one. No. <laughs> so pre-pandemic, uh, I thought that our mission statement actually was we wanted to empower the world's transition towards remote work. About six months into the pandemic, we actually said, man, maybe we should actually change our mission statement because I think we're done. (laughs) I think, you know, when you choose a mission statement, you think to yourself, well, this is something that you should never achieve. If you actually achieve it, then uh, where the heck do you go next? But the difference that I'm really making, at least for me, is again, communicating that not all work has to be a place and that the freedom that you can gain from disconnecting work from time and space is incredibly powerful. And I think it's the single thing that I could do to be able to make the world a better place. I love it. I love it. Liam, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing so many things and actually challenging me on, on the, on an idea that I, that I was uh, not, you know, even privy to until you said it. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. No worries. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's mine. Till next time, kings, queens, and royalty, use your difference to make a difference.